What we aim to do here is really get a unified understanding within the community of just how real this situation is and just how dangerous this virus really is. Now, what we're seeing um, around the globe is a very different um, interpretations, and that's based on the geographical information that people are receiving. So there's very different perceptions of what this virus is actually really capable of. So what we want to do is establish a centralised understanding, put, put to rest a lot of the mis misconceptions, the misinformation, but also establish the right mindset. Because what we want journalists to realise that, you know, in the current environment we're in, we've got to treat this, you know, when we're operating, when we're, when we're exposing ourselves, we've really got to conduct the same sort of planning and risk assessments for this environment as we would as if we were going to a war zone or if we were going to cover a natural disaster or a violent protest. And in many cases, the dangers and the threats for, for, from this environment are actually far worse. Because when we go to those environments, we have a more of a localized threat. What we're dealing with here is a threat that, if not managed properly, it's not just going to harm the people local to us, it's going to have a ripple effect. And it is going to carry on. So, you know, one or two. Um, breaches and, 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 you know, letting our guard down to this could have such a significant impact on the people around us. So that is what we aim to do uh, during the next hour or so. So what I'll do first is uh, we'll start with, I'll hand over to Kane and we'll give you some accurate information about the virus. Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar. I'll just go back to sharing my screen of this for um, an hour if you wanted or just the epidemiology of it for an hour if you wanted so small disclaimer we'll do what we can in 45 minutes but um, we try and provide a lot of sources in this uh, webinar so that you guys can then follow that up and do some in-depth research okay so we'll go to our results and let's just see how we've done see how many responses we got we'll just let it reload Okay, we've got six responses so far. So for anyone that didn't actually see the little um, pre-quiz, these were the questions. Just one, how is coronavirus spread? And um, there's obviously one with a tick there. And there's a whole bunch of symptoms uh, and you're asked to basically put them in order. And then there's a question about how often different parts of the hands are missed when you wash your hands. So let's have a look and see how we did in our results. Okay, so people are pretty good that it's large droplets uh, that, are, that are spreading the virus. Um, I don't actually count that as wrong as much as the form did because spreading through the air is still something that is debatable. And that's why you're seeing healthcare professionals and others wearing respirators uh, where the larger droplets that happen when someone sneezes or coughs can actually be aerosolized and, and become something that you need a respirator for. So through the air might also be okay, but certainly by droplets. Um, is correct. Um, how do we go with the symptoms? Yeah, yeah, most people realise that uh, fever is a very big symptom. That's certainly one of the main ones. I've got the answers coming up, so don't worry, we'll see the exact order in a minute. And you're pretty good here too. So people don't think that you miss the palms too often, which is quite correct. Uh, you are correct that the creases in the palms are sometimes missed. Thumbs, the webbing everywhere is always missed. Fingernails is always missed and back of the hand and wrists are always missed as well. So you're pretty right about how people go when they're washing their hands. Um, so we'll have, we get back to this over, overview in a sec. So here are the symptoms, just so you can have a look. 99% of patients are presenting with fever and surprisingly sneezing actually isn't necessarily that um, that common, but fatigue, a dry cough, much more so than a wet cough, uh, initially at least. Once consolidation forms and a little bit later, perhaps it can get to being more of a wet cough, but a dry cough, loss of appetite, so someone doesn't feel like eating, muscle pain, shortness of breath, and coughing up phlegm. So that's what you're likely to run into. And here's our diagram for where people miss 
when they're cleaning their hands. So anywhere that's red there is frequent, frequently missed. Uh, the back of the hands actually missed more than I, I think than that diagram indicates and the wrists are missed pretty much always as well. So we've got a video on how to do that later that we'll have a look at. So the structure for the next 45 minutes or so, I do go over a brief overview of the current situation. And that's kind of not a, you know, what is a virus versus what is a bacteria, that sort of information. Although we do put sources where you can get that sort of stuff. Um, that's more looking at the current numbers, uh, the current graphs, where we think we're heading uh, in the current situation, and also trying to give you a bit of context historically as to how this thing's shaping up compared to other pandemics of recent and not so recent years. After that, we have a look at social distancing and isolation, why that's so important, and the mask guidance about who should be wearing what sort of mask and when. We've got a bit of something to feed into a risk assessment for organisations a little bit later in the game. So at the moment, I think we're advocating people should be uh, socially distancing and isolating as much as possible. But over the next three months or six months or 12 months, there has to be a stage where society starts re-emerging and some events can be held again in public and some can't. And so there'll be a situation where you're making decisions about which events should we attend as reporters and which shouldn't we. And we've got a couple of checklists for you as, as to the sort of things that events that would make them less a risk or more risk for you guys to consider. We have a look at personal safety. That's things like how to wash your hands, how to fit a respirator mask, uh, what sort of uh, medications and things you might like to have on, how to make disinfectant, all of that sort of stuff. And then Roger's got a really good session on planning, preparation and conducting risk assessments before our Q&A. So straight into the overview of the situation, let's get some terminology right. Um, you're hearing all sorts of different novel coronavirus, uh, SARS, all these different things. So the actual name of the virus itself, the microbe, is SARS-CoV-2 or, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Number 2. Okay, and it's called Number 2 because the SARS virus Number 1 that came out in 2002 uh, needs to be, you know, uh, differentiated from, hence the Number 2. Both of these viruses bind to the same receptor. That's why they're known as SARS-1 and SARS-2. That's the actual similar similarity. They both uh, bind to the same receptor. So COVID-19, on the other hand, is the name of the disease that you get if you have this virus. So SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19, that's the name of the disease discovered in 2019. Um, look, for ease of use, in, in having drawn those distinctions, for ease of use in this webinar, you might hear me just call it coronavirus, which is a very non-specific term of a whole family of viruses. Um, but just for ease of it, I'll, I might call it that, I might call it COVID-19. Um, I mean the same thing for all of them. I mean both the virus and the disease. Should be noted that um, the genetics have revealed there's at least two strains uh, of the virus currently identified, type L and type S. We currently don't know the significance of the difference between them. So we don't know that there's any medical or clinical difference between those two yet. We just know that there are two different ones out there. Okay, so for basic information, for all the sort of what's a virus type stuff, look, there's Wikipedia links that you can go to for all of that stuff. I think, in fact, there's three different pages. There's one on the virus itself, uh, there's one on the disease, and there's one on the pandemic. So you've got plenty of easy information there. Um, this source down the bottom here, this YouTube video, this is actually a really good video, and it covers the epidemiology and the pathophysiology in great detail. Uh, and, and it really explains it well. It's a 50 or 50 minute to an hour sort of you know, YouTube video, but it's well worth the watch. If you actually want to understand how this virus gets its RNA into your cells and starts repurposing your lung cells to, to do what it wants, then that's the video to watch so you really understand what's going on. And the two things that we are going to have a look at now, we're going to have a look at a couple of sources for current numbers for just an you know, overview of what's going on. Um, and then we're going to have a look at a couple of sources that really show you the best practice science currently available. Um, and these are good because these are really sources that doctors are looking at. Um, so they're well worth a look. So we'll have a quick peek at all of that stuff and just set the scene a little bit. So here are the numbers from 738. So what's that? That's uh, not very long ago at all, uh, less than an hour ago. 472,000 odd cases, 21,000 deaths. Um, so if anyone does a quick bit of math, you can tell that that is a roughly 4.5% uh, fatality rate if 
the 472,000 were the only cases in existence, which of course they're not. They're just the only cases that have been detected. Um, and the estimates I've seen are that there may be as many as 10 times as many undetected cases currently compared to detected cases, at which point the fatality rate obviously goes down by a factor of 10. Um, so we'll see that go down as we go. But the graphs are still looking horribly exponential. They're still accelerating um, very, very quickly. And even if you put them logarithmically, it started again. So that initial curve there that you see is kind of where China is said to have got its problem uh, under control. And then the rest of the world is what then starts accelerating this graph again as the rest of the world's infections take over. It's the same thing with the deaths. Uh, we, start, we see it, you know, when China got theirs under control or we're told they did, starts to even off, but then accelerates again. The other thing this page is good for, it gives you a count uh, and how many new cases, um, a particular note today, um, that's, this is updated every 12 hours. Um, and so the US that I think had more than 10,000 new cases, they're really starting to accelerate, um, which is a concern. And the other figure we're interested in, I'm just going to Australia because this is where I know the figure for this. The other thing we're really concerned about is this serious or critical column which in Australia is only 11 people so far, which is good, because these are the people that are going to need intensive care unit beds. And in Australia, I know, for example, that we only have approximately 2,500 intensive care unit beds in the entire country. And so that number there, currently very low at 11 for us, needs to stay under 2,500 or we will have to start making decisions about who gets the treatment they need and who doesn't. And you can see up there, Italy, 3,500 uh, serious or critical cases at the current time would already overwhelm our health system uh, if that was here. So that's one page that you can kind of follow for the figures. John, Johns Hopkins does a, a nice graphic uh, and gives you the same sort of information, how many, how many cases, how many deaths. Um, and the other page I like actually comes from the Financial Times for this basic overview sort of information because um, it gives you a good comparison. So... This allows you to actually compare the number of deaths. That's what this actual uh, graph is. And so going down at the x-axis, you can kind of compare where different countries are at the same time. So this yellow line here is China, and we can see that at the same stage as Spain or France or Italy have had, uh, at the same stage, they've got more deaths than China did um, at the same time, uh, which, is, which is of concern gives your graph and actual regions that have had enough cases and it also compares the trajectories for different countries um, and obviously the steeper that graph the worst so cases doubling every day at this angle every two days at this angle which is almost the US uh, and a couple of other countries are almost doubling every two days every three days which is about Australia at the moment um, and then countries that have managed to sort of curb that spread down to every week uh, which is really what they need to control it. Uh, there's some other some other cool things uh, like yeah little graphs like that that are worth looking at. But so, in terms of getting information that's really best practice out there, this uh, website is run by a, an associate professor, Dr. Farkas. Uh, he's an associate professor of medicine. He's a very well respected intensivist and pulmonologist, or someone that specialises in the lung, which is very relevant for this. Um, and he's been keeping this up to date every day or two with the very latest uh, results in terms of scientific trials of different retrovirals, um, the uh, chloroquine, et cetera, trials, uh, all of that stuff. So if you look at the sort of information that's here, it's very high level information. Um, it's best for people who have access to a university and, and have database access. The next link I show you shows you all the free, freely available um, stuff that you don't need sort of database access to get if you want that level of information. Um, but yeah, this, this is basically what um, intensive care unit doctors in other countries are looking at and following to get the very best information uh, around things like transmission, large droplet transmission, uh, quite correct, airborne transmission, question marks. So there's still a bit of uncertainty uh, around that. And you can see here, he cites all of the sources. Now, the problem is if you click on some of these, you'll get them. Other ones, you'll need to log in uh, and have some sort of university contact. Whereas this source is the open access source. 
Um, and so sometimes you can get the source from this page and then go over here and you might still find it and, and it's available on that page. This one has three different levels of information. The clinical topic again is kind of the very detailed and scientific information. Patient education is much more publicly digestible. And it's also got a very good page on the guidelines, um, which basically it has the guidelines for all of the different countries. So the World Health Organization ones, but also Canada, the US, Europe, United Kingdom, Australia, et cetera. Um, so there's some really good information there. And as I understand it, you guys are gonna be provided these links. Um, the last page I wanted to look at with you guys uh, is kind of a bit of a historical comparison. When these sort of events happen, sometimes it's difficult to get a handle on how big or small they are uh, historically. So this is a history of pandemics um, and all the different things that have uh, taken that title through time. We'll kind of concentrate just on the most recent period. You can see down the bottom there, there's the COVID-19. At the time this graphic was taken, there was 14.6 thousand deaths. Now there's 20 odd thousand. Um, but just to give you some figures to try and give you guys a handle on where we are in this and how big or small it might be, if you assume that 60% of the human population ends up getting coronavirus, um, and, and the estimates I've seen are 60 to 80% um, if they don't come up with a, a vaccine, et cetera, without all of those things, and if social distancing doesn't slow it down, et cetera, et cetera, so 60 or 80%, let's say 60%, of seven and a half billion humans end up contracting this virus. Um, if you say there's only a 1% fatality rate, which is being generous, that still uh, results in 45 million deaths. Um, if 60% of humanity gets it and there's a 1% fatality rate. So that puts it around Spanish flu, uh, if that's sort of where it turns out to be. Um, if you take it down to about a 0.45%, fatality rate, so that's one tenth of the current reported rate of four and a half percent. So if we assume that there's 10 times as many people with it as have been detected and we reduce that fatality rate, that's still 20 million people that this epidemic will end up killing, um, which makes it as bad as HIV AIDS uh, and HIV has taken 40 years to kill that many people. Um, so we don't know, you know, even at 0.1%, it'd still be four and a half million. Um, so the truth is we don't know whether it will get through that much of humanity. We don't know how quickly, we don't know what the actual fatality rate is, but hopefully those sort of possibilities that, you know, conservatively, this could be four and a half million people, um, conservatively, and it could be a lot more than that, give you some sort of historical context as to where we are. We, we really are in the infant stages of a pandemic. Um, and yeah, we've just got to wait and see what happens. So what do we do in that situation? What actions should we be taking? Uh, so let's, we're going to have a look at social distancing and isolation and surgical mask guidance. So we've got a little video here for you to watch just about what social distancing kind of is at its core. Social distancing is really physical separation of people where in circumstances where there are crowds, you, you remove yourself from very close contact. This is what we refer to when we ask people to say at least six feet apart. And you may say, why six feet apart? Because there's been a lot of scientific evidence with respiratory diseases is that's how far your droplets can go when you sneeze or cough. Stay at home if possible. Uh, don't go out on any unnecessary travel or trips and to make sure you're staying away from crowded places like movie theaters and concerts. You can actually socially distance yourself from your workplace by doing teleworking. You can socially distance yourself from people in social settings by not going to bars, not going to restaurants, not going to theaters where there are a lot of people. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others who might actually be infected or infect you. Yeah, sounds simple, simple enough, right, yeah, as a concept. And we're about to look at why this is so important. Um, but there was one Australian guideline that I wanted to look at. And I don't want to, you know, reference Australia very often, but this particular guideline I like because it has some specific suggestions about how to socially distance when you're at home, if you're at home with someone sick, if you're in the workplace and et cetera. And I thought they were worth covering just to add to that, you know, general bit on what social distancing is. Um, so in households to reduce the spread of germs, um, 
good hand hygiene and sneeze and cough hygiene or etiquette or sneezing or coughing into your elbow, um, making sure you wash your hands if you sneeze or cough onto them. That's in all of these situations. Uh, but avoid handshaking, kissing, regularly disinfect high touch surfaces such as tables, kitchen benches and doorknobs, increase ventilation in the home, uh, visit shops sparingly, buy more goods and services online uh, and buy more at once when you shop. So I, I normally get fresh, fresh veg every couple of days. Now I'm trying to shop once a week if I can. Consider whether outings travel are sensible and necessary. Uh, where people are ill, you care for them in a single room if possible and you only have one carer for that person if possible. You keep the door to their room closed and their window open, so you try to increase ventilation within their room but not have that ventilation shared with the rest of the home. Um, whenever someone else is in the room with the sick person, then that sick person should be wearing a surgical mask uh, and it's advisable for the person caring for them when they know that they've got COVID to be wearing it uh, when they're in the room with them as well. And you've got to consider those vulnerable family members. So anyone over 65, anyone with uh, comorbidities, who's immunocompromised, et cetera, really shouldn't be around a person who has this illness at all. So in the workplace, stay at home if you're sick, first and most obviously. The greetings, the handshakes, try and hold meetings via video conferencing or phone calls, defer large meetings. Uh, if you've got to hold a meeting, try and hold it outside in the open air if you can. Promote good hand hygiene and, and sneeze and cough etiquette, of course. Take your lunch at your desk rather than having it in a lunch room with a big group of people. Clean and disinfect high touch surfaces regularly. Consider opening windows, getting that ventilation up. Limit food handling and sharing. Um, reconsider travel. And of course, if you do have something like a canteen at work, the most dangerous people in this situation are people like barristers or food handlers, someone that's literally putting the top, the top on every coffee that everyone drinks, they're potential super spreaders. So the hygiene of those sort of people that come into contact with so many others in a way that potentially could transmit the virus, very, very important. Um, and in schools, of course, if your child's sick, they shouldn't go. Uh, and there should be plenty of sanitising of hands. So I just like that particular guideline. Um, as for why we're doing this social isolation, what are we trying to achieve with it? We'll just have a quick look at a couple of graphs. As we saw in the earlier graph, most of these lines at the moment are showing that people are doubling every three days. And in fact, at the moment, the more recent graphs are showing the US is almost doubling every two days. The aim of the government measures, if you look at this red line, which is Australia, um, Australia is currently doubling every three days, which will overwhelm our health system if that keeps happening. Um, we want the social distancing, the isolation, the better hand hygiene, all of those measures, just to slow down the spread to only doubling every six days or so. If that happens, then we think that we can handle um, the infections that occur. So these measures, the social distancing, it's really, aimed at just slowing things down so that the health system can deal with it. Um, and it, there was a very interesting study to come out of the University of Sydney yesterday, uh, which showed the importance of the group's behaviour uh, in this situation to having these social distancing measures be effective. Um, you can see all the reference there, but we'll just go to the picture so you can get a big version of that. Uh, and what these people, and this is a very serious model, uh, these people model normal influenza, you're talking high computing power um, and, and, a, and a very reliable sort of model. And the 25 words or less version of what these researchers found was that if 80% of people in this country comply with the social distancing requirements, they, they stay home if they're sick, they don't go out unless they have to, et cetera, et cetera. If 80% of people comply with that, they think the virus will be brought under control within 13 weeks. If 70%, only 70% comply with it, it won't matter how long the isolation and distancing and quarantine continues, they will never get control of the virus. So that's literally how important it is to follow these social distancing and isolation suggestions. If eight people out of 10 do it, the virus can be controlled. If only seven out of 10 people do it, the virus will never be controlled using these group behavior sort of approaches. So yeah, really, really important. Um, the last graphic I've got for you is kind of just uh, an infographic. 
on what does it mean, uh, then, you know, before you leave home, you should ask yourself, is it absolutely necessary for me to leave home at the moment? And I like how it's got not necessary, for example, the beach, which unfortunately in the last week has been an issue in Australia where beaches like Bondi Beach have actually been closed because people are still turning up to it. Family gatherings, gym, birthdays, just about any meal out, not essential to go out for those things at this time. Can, can whatever you're going out for be substituted is the next question. Uh, for example, can you work from home? Could you live stream the church service or could you Zoom the meeting like we're doing right now? Um, can you get a home delivered meal rather than going out to get it? If, if the answer is still no, can the task be postponed? And that means, of course, postponed for months. Um, lastly, have you been honest with yourself for all of those questions? And if you still think you have to go out, then go alone, minimise the time spent out, keep distance, avoid touching people and things as much as you can, do your hand hygiene and have your cough and sneeze etiquette. Really social isolation in a nutshell and, and hopefully you kind of realise how important it is looking at uh, what the research suggests could happen if people do or don't adopt these behaviours successfully as a group. So we're on to surgical mask guidance. I think we've got a World Health video for you on this and it just gives you a little bit of advice about when a mask needed, when are they? Uh, which is obviously one of the key questions for people at the current time. <laughs> If you do not have any respiratory symptoms such as fever, cough, or runny nose, you do not need to wear a medical mask like this one. Mask alone can give you a false feeling of protection and can even be a source of infection when not used correctly. Masks should only be used by healthcare workers, caretakers, or by people who are sick with symptoms of fever and cough. Why? Because healthcare workers and caretakers are in close contact with ill individuals, so they are at higher risk of catching COVID-19. And sick people should wear masks to protect others from small droplets that can come out when they cough or sneeze. So, for healthcare workers, caretakers, or individuals who have fever and cough, this is how you should wear a mask. Before touching the mask, clean your hands with alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. Inspect the mask for tears or holds. Verify which side is the top. This is where the metal piece is. Then identify the inside of the mask, which is usually the white side. Then fit the mask on your face. Pinch the metal strip or stiff edge so it holds to the shape of your nose. Adjust the mask over your face, covering your mouth and chin, making sure there are no gaps between your face and the mask. Do not touch the front of the mask while using it to avoid contamination. If you accidentally touch it, clean your hands. To take off the mask, remove the elastics from behind without touching the front and keep it away from your face. Discard the mask immediately in a closed bin and clean your hands. It is important not to reuse the mask. Replace it with a new one as soon as it gets damp. And remember, the best way to protect yourself from the new coronavirus is frequently cleaning your hands with alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. Stay safe and see you next time. Yeah, so some, some good advice there. And look, those type of surgical masks, the main use for those is putting them on someone who's sick so that you can limit their ability to spread large droplets and thereby transmit the virus. Um, people who are in a healthcare role, though, have been told now to wear, some, at least in Australia, are being told to wear respirator masks. And the reason for that is that some procedures that healthcare professionals do create an aerosolization of these large droplets into smaller bits that can be around in the air. And the jury's still out about whether those airborne particles can infect someone. Um, but certainly if you're going into an environment where you know that people have COVID-19, it's a valid thing to think about having a respirator mask. The issue of course being uh, how to get these things at the current time and if you can get them, how many of them you're going to get. So I found some interesting research uh, about reusing uh, and, and using for an extended period uh, respirator masks. The research was done for health professionals, of course, 
but given how difficult these things may be able to get, let alone to get a box of them, it's unlikely that you guys will be able to swap a mask out for every you know, next interview you do or, or next even day at times. So I thought it was important to mention that there is some research out there that looked into extended use of one respirator mask. So that's where in, in this research particularly it was a healthcare professional, but they didn't change masks in between each patient. They actually left them on in between patients. Uh, and they were found to be safe to do that for up to eight hours. Uh, obviously, you have to be aware that as soon as you put the mask on, you assume that the front of it is contaminated. So you've got to be very careful about touching the mask and doing your hand hygiene uh, if that's the case. And reuse, as opposed to extended use, refers to actually donning and doffing the mask multiple times uh, in between patients in this example, but it could be interviews or whatever else you're doing. And the advice there was to put it in a breathable bag in between use, so a paper bag, and obviously to label it. Because if you've got you and your team and there's three or five of you or how many people are there and you're all taking your masks off and putting them on and putting them in a bag, you wanna know who's who's so that you don't end up putting Joe's mask on by mistake. Um, the guidance in terms of how many times can you take them on and, and uh, take them off and put them back on, was to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. And barring that, if there is no recommendation, then five times was thought to be safe in this research. Obviously, as soon as you see any damage or as soon as the mask doesn't seal properly, and we show you how to test the seal a little bit later, as soon as it doesn't do either of those things, then you've got to go for a new one. Uh, and taking it off and putting it on, you've got to be very careful not to touch the inside of it. So the outside's contaminated. If you then touch the inside, you've contaminated the inside and it's no good, you'd have to swap it again. But there is some research out there saying you can use them for an extended period and you can reuse them um, quite a few times as well safely, as long as you're aware of the, the contaminated outside and, and the hand hygiene and stuff you need to have around it. Okay, so moving on to event attendance precautions. This is kind of looking forwards to a period of time where we're starting to re-emerge into society. Some events are starting to be held again. You know, not everything's cancelled. Um, and you, as an organisation and as an individual, you're starting to have to make decisions about how risky is this event that I'm considering going to as a reporter? Uh, and what sort of things should I look for to be in place at the event to, to make that decision about what sort of risk I'm facing. Um, it's modelled on something St John Ambulance Australia had for their staff. Uh, if, you know, if they wanted paramedics to go to the local car races or something, this was what they wanted to see in place to judge the risk for their own staff. So there's a couple of uh, checklists that we'll show you that are uh, worth seeing. Okay, so one's for an outdoor event and one's for an indoor event. And these are the sort of things that you want to see are in place or you want to know whether they are there or aren't there so that you can appreciate the risk of the situation that you're about to enter. So there should be hand sanitizer freely available at the event and participants should be being encouraged to use it. There should be toilet uh, soap in all the toilets and there should be signs on the back reminding people to wash for 20 seconds. Um, participants should have been encouraged to fill in a form declaring that they haven't been overseas for the last 14 days and they haven't been in contact with anyone that's been overseas for the last 14 days. You'd appreciate it's a very different level of risk going to an event where everyone has stated they haven't been overseas or been in contact with anyone from overseas versus where that's not in place and you don't know where people have come from when. Very different risk presenting. Um, obviously no one should go to any event if they're feeling unwell, um, particularly in this situation. Um, there should be no sharing of equipment between journalists or event participants, so cameras, microphones, etc. Uh, and this should be made known by the organiser. Same, food and drink shouldn't be being shared. Um, you know, that's something you should be taking your own food and your own drink. Briefings or speeches should be conducted outdoors, ideally, and kept to a 15 minute duration. Um, the numbers should be kept as low as possible. Maybe the event you're going to is a football game. Perhaps there's 30 players on the field. Well, if they all bring the 10 members of their extended family and friends, suddenly you're at, a, at an event with a thousand people and that's a much higher risk. So these events, initially at least, I think will be encouraged to be as small as possible. Um, 
In Australia, the social distancing guidelines are 1.5 metres apart for outdoor events and four square metres or two metres in any direction in an indoor event. But uh, I think there's different, slightly different guidelines uh, around the world for that. 1.5 metres, that's almost your six feet that someone's thought to be able to sneeze their droplets. But the event organiser should be reminding people of those social distancing requirements, whatever they are in your jurisdiction, if they're still in place at the time. This second last point is a really important one. And that's about people realising that when you're assessing the risk in these situations, it's not just the risk to yourself, it's the risk to the members of your immediate household and to anyone that your immediate household might be coming into contact with. So, for example, if, if you decide to go to an event and then you come back and, you know, your significant other is visiting their elderly parents every three days to drop shopping off to them or something, then by attending the event, you may have inadvertently put some, uh, some vulnerable people at risk. So you really need to consider the, the wider uh, effects that your actions could have. And if anyone becomes unwell at the event, they should go home immediately uh, and contact health authorities by telephone. So there's some of the things at an outdoor event that you need to consider when you're assessing uh, the risk of covering an event. Indoor events are very similar. Um, two metres in every direction, that's just the Australian standard, but whatever the social distancing standard is, should be hand sanitizer. should be soap in the toilets. People shouldn't be going to these events if they feel unwell. Um, things like food, drink, eating utensils, equipment shouldn't be being shared. Uh, seating arrangements should allow for the distancing requirements, whatever they are. Um, if people are eating, there should be hand washing before eating. Hard surfaces should be being cleaned. Um, it's strongly suggested that nobody over the age of 70 attend uh, in these sort of higher risk environments that we're all going to be in for some time. Uh, speech is kept to a minimum, 15 minutes outdoor if possible. If people are going to be sharing a microphone, then ideally it should be sanitised. I mean, it'd be better if when people are giving speeches it wasn't shared at all. Um, we just need to be very careful with those sort of things at the current time. And again, you've got to be aware of the larger ramifications uh, in terms of who else in your household and in the immediate contacts of your household that you're also taking the risks for when you're considering doing these events. And if anyone becomes unwell, they should go home. Um, so there are some checklists to consider when you're considering the risks uh, as, as everyone emerges back into society uh, and you're making those decisions about, do we want to go to this event, don't we? What sort of precautions do we take? And like always, it's, it's horses for courses. And if you've got the right PPE and procedures in place, then you might be able to go into a slightly more high risk environment. If you don't have the right things or the equipment available, then you've got to do the right thing there. Okay, so personal safety. Personal safety is about hand and clothes washing, masks, antiseptic, and some medications and other things that I think you probably should have on hand now. Um, in case you get sick in the near future. So hand washing, um, what we're doing at the moment, we're treating our homes as sterile fields and I'll, I'll explain that. What I mean by that is um, I assume as soon as I leave my home now that my hands are contaminated, at least my hands, as soon as I walk out the door, I assume my hands are contaminated and I do my best to try and adopt a very difficult behavioral change, which is to stop touching my face. It's quite an unconscious thing and it's difficult to do. It's actually an advantage of wearing a mask even when you don't need one is it stops you being able to touch your face. Similar with some people you see wearing disposable gloves. Um, it actually probably helps you realise when you are and aren't touching your face. So when we leave home, we assume that we're contaminated. When I come back home, the very first thing I do, I walk in the door and I take note of whether I've touched the inside door handle or not as I'm closing the door. And I go straight to the basin and I wash my hands with soap. It's the very first thing I do, and I do that before I touch anything else inside my own living environment. Um, if I've been to a high risk situation, so if I've been working as a paramedic and I'm quite sure that I've got uh, soiled clothes and stuff like that, then I'll take it a step further. I'll walk in the door, again, taking note of whether I touch that door handle, and I'll walk straight to the laundry and I'll take my uniform straight off into the washing machine and I'll get straight into the shower. To wash with soap. So I'm decontaminating myself as soon as I get into the into my living environment before I'm touching anything in that living environment, trying to keep that viral load down within the environment. And then I'll get something like Glen 20, the uh, commercially available uh, spray that disinfects things and is actually quite good on porous surfaces. 
Um, so it's a good thing to spray like material with and stuff like that, as opposed to hard surfaces. We'll talk about disinfectants in a minute, but I'll disinfect the inside handle to the toilet, for example, the inside handle of the door, maybe the tap handle, stuff like that. I'll spray that with the spray. Um, when you're washing your hands, um, use soap, dishwashing soap, uh, if your hands are soiled. So if there's dirt on your hands or peanut butter or whatever it is you've got on your hands, if there's something on your hands, you actually have to use soap and water to get the organic matter off because the organic matter can actually deactivate the active ingredient in alcohol-based hand rubs. If your hands aren't actively soiled, so they don't have literal dirt on them, then it's fine to use um, alcohol-based hand rub as long as you do it using the right technique. So we've got a video for you just showing you the five steps of uh, proper hand washing that every paramedic and doctor and nurse has been taught for 30 years. So let's watch this video and uh, see how we should be doing it. Please note that this technique is not appropriate when hands are visibly dirty or after using the toilet. In these cases, hand washing is required. Hand rubbing should take you 20 to 30 seconds. Use a timer or count one, two, three, four, five in each of the following steps. Apply a palm full of alcohol-based hand rub in a cupped hand, enough to cover all surfaces of the hands. Rub hands palm to palm, then rub right palm over the back of left hand with interlaced fingers and vice versa. Rub again palm to palm with fingers interlaced. Rub the back of your fingers to opposing palms with fingers interlocked, repeating this action for each hand. Rub rotationally left thumb clasped in right palm and vice versa. To clean the tips of your fingers, rub rotationally backwards and forwards with clasped fingers of right hand in left palm and vice versa. Once dry, your hands are now clean and safe. Yeah, so there's quite a bit um, to doing that properly. You only need to go through those steps a couple of times and you remember it. Probably the one people don't understand is this one. And it's actually this part of the fingers that they're washing with the palm of the other hand when they do that one. That's actually what they're trying to do there. But yep, worth realising that we're about to have a look at masks and how to fit those properly. It's the same with hand washing. You can do this or you, you, know, you can do it effectively. And you really have to do it effectively for it not to be a waste of time. So it's worth doing that and having a look. Um, we've got a World Health Organization recipe for how to make hand sanitizer. Um, it comes with a bit of a warning though. So there's two different, two different recipes, one of them that uses ethanol and one of them that uses isopropyl alcohol in those concentrations. Um, and you can see what else you need there. Hydrogen peroxide, 3%, not 20%, 3% from the chemist and some glycerol. The water does have to be sterile, um, or again, organic matter in the water can deactivate the active ingredients. Um, but there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a warning. Um, and as much as it tells you exactly how much of all of these things that you can mix together to make this, and it shows you how to do it, the important steps are that there's quality control using an alcohol meter, um, both before you do it and after you've produced the hand sanitizer. And that's necessary to make sure you've actually got the required amount um, of ethanol or isopropyl alcohol so that the hand sanitizer is actually an effective um, sanitizer of your hands and you're not just you know, rubbing ineffective gel on your hands. So this, this is available, um, this particular recipe and things are difficult to come by at the moment. Um, so it might be a valid thing if you can also get one of these alcohol meters to test what you're making so that you know that it's effective. And if you've got the right equipment, fantastic, uh, then you can do that. If you don't have the right equipment, then it's potentially uh, very difficult to control the quality of what you're doing. Um, masks, that's a very important topic. As we've said, the primary use for masks is for the people who are sick to wear. Uh, so that they don't infect others around them. But if you know you're going to be around a lot of people with COVID-19, um, which as a healthcare professional, you know, uh, and I think as a reporter, you may know that you're certainly, uh, the possibility is that you're going to be around people, then it's, it's quite a valid exercise to wear 
a respirator um, to try and avoid those smaller aerosolized particles um, that can be in the air. So I think we've got a video here on how to properly fit and test an N95 or P2, depending on your jurisdiction, a respirator. And it's worth realizing again that this sort of PPE is only effective if it's used properly. So we'll watch this, uh, watch this video on how to properly fit one. Putting on N95, 3M1860. Perform hand hygiene before putting on mask. Choose the correct size of the mask and ensure there are no defects. Hold the N95 in your palm with the nose piece at fingertips. Hang head straps freely below hand. Position the N95 under your chin with the nose piece up. While holding the N95 in place, pull the top strap over your head so it rests high on the back of your head. Pull the bottom strap over your head and position it around your neck, below your ears. If you have long hair, the strap must be positioned beneath your hair. Untwist the straps. Position the N95 low on your nose. Using both hands, mold the nose piece to the shape of your nose by pushing downward and outward, while moving your fingertips down both sides of the nose piece. Perform a fit check by placing both hands completely over the mask. Be careful not to disturb the position and exhale sharply. If air leaks around your nose, adjust the nose piece as described in step 5. If air leaks at the mask edges, adjust the straps back along the sides of your head. Perform fit check again if an adjustment is made. Wear the right size mask. Fit check is mandatory for all users of N95 mask and must be performed every time upon wearing. Perform hand hygiene after putting on mask. Pull bottom strap overhead. Maintain the hold on the first strap. Use another hand to pull the top strap overhead. Do not touch front surface of mask. It should be kept in a new clean Ziploc bag for reuse and discarded at end of day unless wet or soiled. Perform hand hygiene after removal of mask and after putting on the reused mask. Putting on... Okay, so that's a video about how to properly um, fit and test, most importantly, a mask. And it really is important to make sure you've got that seal because the whole purpose of the respirator is to filter out those smaller particles. And obviously that only happens if air can't get through a gap uh, anywhere in the mask. So each time you put it on, you've actually got to do that seal check and it's only effective as PPE uh, if it's currently sealing to your face. Bit of, bit of a gender-based issue there too. Um, facial hair can make it almost impossible to get one of those respirators to seal. And you'd also notice if you've got long hair, you need to get one of the straps um, over the back of your head as you're putting it on. Okay, so as Kane's mentioned, there's a P1 and the P2 mask. So the P1 is a mask that we'd use if we suspected that we were infected or we knew we were infected. So basically the P1 is to contain the spread of, of our own particles from our own breath or coughing, et cetera. So what we got here, this is the most common type of P1 mask that you'll see around. It's a surgical mask. But again, they come in different models as, as with uh, a lot of the uh, personal protective equipment we use. So this one, again, is a P1 mask. But what we need to be careful of, because this is a P2 mask. So as you can see, they look identical. So as with all personal protective equipment, we need to know about the rating. So it's not the physical appearance that we're worried about, it's what it's actually rated to. So on all these uh, model masks, they will have written on them the ratings, whether it's P1 or the P2 or the N95. So, you know, make sure that you check uh, the rating because otherwise, you know, if you pick up a P1, 
and you think you're going into a contaminated environment because you thought it was a P2, you've actually increased the risk to yourself because now you've got this false sense of security thinking that you've got a piece of personal protective equipment on when actually you're wearing the P1 mask. So again, I can't stress enough how, how important it is that you look at the ratings on these, uh, these masks. And what we've got here as well is another model of uh, the P2. Now this one has a valve in it. So, uh, you know, the benefit of this one is the moisture does not build up inside the mask. So it actually has a, a longer a usable lifespan. And um, so if you, if you do have the luxury of getting these and these are available, it would be the preferred version. But, you know, at the moment, any mask is a luxury. But now on that point as well, I just want to talk about improvised masks. Now, the reality of an improvised mask is it's, it doesn't work. So if you think that you're using an improvised mask, you don't have a mask. So the reality of that is you've got to do your risk assessment as if you have no PPE, no personal protective equipment. And we'll look at the risk assessment a bit later on. But, you know, that's the reality of it. Very similar to, uh, you know, what Kane said about the hand gel. Without the correct measures, you don't have any idea of what it's actually stopping. Okay. Very true. Okay, so we've just got antiseptic uh, and some equipment to go. Uh, and then we'll get on to the, the risk assessment part. Uh, this little graph here that you can see is, is just a scientific study of how long uh, COVID-19 can last on different surfaces in comparison to uh, the earlier SARS virus that came out in 2002. Um, you can see that even aerosolized, so even when there's small, not, not the actual sneeze droplets, but those made much smaller so that they can float around in the air, even in that form, it's thought that they can last for up to three hours. So frighteningly, there's been some research that suggested literally someone can sneeze three hours ago and you can walk through that sneeze three hours later uh, and it's possible um, that you could still pick up an infection from that. And then you see looking down, uh, copper, cardboard up to 24 hours, steel 48 hours uh, and plastic up to 72 hours or, or three days. Um, so if you start to think about the equipment that you're using, the cameras and microphones and tripods and your car, for example, with all the plastic dash and everything like that, you can see that the virus has extended uh, survival times on, on several of those surfaces and really needs to, you really need to be disinfecting um, things as you go. In terms of uh, disinfectant, if you've got commercial disinfectant available to you, then that's really what you should be using. Um, again, the sort of spray, the Glen 20 is one brand of it, but disinfectant spray is meant to be particularly good for porous surfaces, materials, uh, leather, stuff like that, uh, and wipes uh, the disinfectant of choice for the hard surfaces. We do here have a, um, a recipe for making disinfectant using bleach. Uh, the active ingredient is sodium hypochlorite. And it has been tested on both the earlier SARS virus and on the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus. Um, and in a lesser concentration of 0.1%, uh, one minute was enough to inactivate those earlier viruses, um, which are very similar. So if you put one part of this 5% bleach with nine parts water, you basically are creating a solution five times stronger than what we know deactivated these earlier similar viruses within one minute. Uh, so if you're spraying things with this stronger solution and you're leaving it there for five minutes, then that will definitely deactivate the virus. Obviously, if you're ever dealing with bleach, um, do it in a ventilated area. So the last thing I've got for you is just some medications. Yep. What I'll do, just, just going back to your oh, yeah, last sure. point. Um, so when I'm sterilising my equipment, what I, what I do is, uh, like this is the stuff I normally use. So this is just... Uh, a household bleach, Domestos, but the one I go for, so I just got this from uh, the supermarket and I looked for the uh, hospital grade. But that's not, uh, that's not essential. 
Um, what you really need to be looking at is the, the, the ratings that Kane mentioned earlier. So the percentages that Kane mentioned, you will find written on the actual bottle. So when you, when you buy it, that's what you're looking for. And then what I do is I will mix this up to the uh, one uh, one percent to uh, one one part to nine one part bleach to nine parts water. I'll make it up in in this, and then I will spray it onto the surfaces of the equipment that I'm using. And then, depending on the material, I will leave it for the contact time that's recommended. Uh, usually, I'll, I'll go the five minutes anyway because I, I usually do it in a systematic way. So I'll sterilize my equipment. And then while I'm waiting for it to dry, I'll be doing something else. So I, I will always go for the maximum time I can. But this is what I use. Okay, thanks, yeah, Kay. Good. Okay, so lastly, a few things that I think you'd be well advised to have uh, in your possession now before anyone gets sick and is locked down in their house for 14 days. Um, so paracetamol or whatever it's called in your jurisdiction or ibuprofen, they're just pain relievers. Uh, the sort of thing that you're going to want when you're feeling crook. Uh, salbutamol or asthma inhalers and decongestants, they're things to help with your breathing. Uh, and really the rest of it is just stuff that, you know, you don't want to be uncomfortable when you're locked in your home uh, and not able to go out because you're sick and you don't know how sick you might be. You may be that sick that you can't actually go out to get these things even if you'd like to. So it's, these are just some things I thought you'd be wise to have. So Imodium is for treating diarrhea, it stops that. A laxative obviously stops constipation, antiacids for your stomach, antihistamines if you've got any um, allergies, sleep aids if you need them, eye comfort drops, female sanitary products, you know, whatever you guys need as your own personal stuff, you know, I put there humorously chicken soup, whiskey or whatever you cuddle yourself with when you're sick. Um, whatever you want in that environment, that's really stuff that you should already have at this stage. All right, so what we're gonna look at now then, so Kane's basically given you a foundation, uh, given you resources uh, to do your research, given you an idea of the protocols um, and the practices that we have to establish. And these have to be set in place, they have to be set in stone. We'll give the resources out uh, later, so you'll have the link so that you can do your own research. So now we're going to talk about the planning aspects of it. So the first thing we really need to think about is risk versus reward. Is the task worth the risk that we're about to take? And if it isn't, then we don't do it. And you can think back to the model, uh, if you think the Red Cross model that uh, Kane mentioned earlier, that gives you an idea of how we sort of conduct these assessments. So we'd have a look at, now let's say we decided that, okay, we're gonna go and do the task. Now remembering that when we leave the, the, the sterile confines of our own home, we are now going into what we should consider as a contaminated area. So another one of the assessments we've got to think about is a self-assessment, an assessment of ourselves and our team if we're going in with colleagues. So, you know, what is our age? Are we in the, the vulnerable age bracket? Do we have any, any underlining sicknesses or ailments that make us more vulnerable? You know, general health, but this can also be, you know, our headspace. Where are we, you know, where is our mental uh, headspace at the moment? If we've just been dealing with a potentially traumatic story or, or environment, are we mentally in the right headspace to go on with this task? You know, and the thing is, it's about doing the research and knowing what we're about to get ourselves into. The same as, as you know, every other task we do as journalists. You know, we're going to war zones, as I've said before. We need to apply the same amount of research into our own safety as we would the story we're about to tell. Okay, so... What we need to think about once we've done the self-assessment is the environment we're going into. So where's the environment we're going into um, large enough or um, safe enough for us to maintain some of the, the practices and protocols? So can we do the job and maintain the social distancing that we need to, to, to do? Um, what is the number of people that are going to be in the venue? 
you know, what is the risks that the venue or the environment we're going into uh, offer and what measures in, in place uh, to, to, to protect ourselves, you know, and, and one thing is we would, we would take our own hand gel anyway, but we would want to have an idea of what, what, what resources were available there, hand washing, uh, this sort of thing. Then we need to evaluate the transport. How are we going to get there? Are we going to self-drive? Uh, are we going to take a taxi? You know, and if we if we if we're going to travel in public transport, then we need to be thinking about the the protocols we need to put in place. So if we're self-driving, decontaminate. Hello, everybody. We seem to have lost the guys over in Australia. Let's see if we can get them back online. Just bear with us a moment. Yeah, I think we're back. Are we back? Yeah. Yep, you're back. Off you go, guys. Okay, Welcome. so um, where did you lose? Whereabouts did you lose us from? You were just about to go through the um, protocol for when you're traveling in a taxi or traveling in a car or a vehicle. Okay. And then sort of yep. So, so uh, just to rewind a bit then, just to get us back in sync. So we'll, we've, we've looked at the venue. Now we're assessing our modes of transport. So if we're going to self-drive, you know, we've got to have established practices, sterilizing our hands before we get in the vehicle, being conscious of what we touch in the vehicle, and then when we get the opportunity and as soon as practically possible, we need to decontaminate those areas. So, you know, common areas in a vehicle is steering wheel, door handles, seat belts. And then you want to be, we want to start ad ad adapting the practices of when we're in the vehicle, not touching everything, like sitting there with your hands on your lap. And that way, at least we can uh, maintain an awareness of what we've actually potentially contaminated. If we're going into public transport, do we have the appropriate PPE? Because again, we, we're going into a potentially hazardous environment. Is it appropriate? Again, these, these will all change as this thing develops or you know, declines. And, and the measures, it's something that we have to monitor all the time because it's, 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 an, escalate, it's an escalating unknown at the moment. So, you know, it's the same as when we cover a protest or we go into a high threat environment. We have to be up to date with current affairs, current trends, current developments, because what was yesterday's development may be significantly changed, you know, over the period of a few days. So it's important that we monitor uh, the situation. We also need to be conscious of secondary threats, secondary risks, because you know, again, as with most events, it's not just the obvious, it's, it's the secondary um, things, hazards we need to think about. So, you know, what would be the repercussions from the state, you know, covering a story as a journalist? And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. What could be the repercussions from the local, the local people, um, you know, the individuals? So, again, are we going to be putting ourselves at risk just because of the job we're doing? And a couple of examples, and I'll just look down to uh, get the names, make sure I get them right. But uh, in, in Wahoon, there was a, a lawyer called Chen Kushi, and he basically was reporting on um, the Chinese censorship and, you know, a lot of the misinformation. He showed a footage, some footage of uh, dead bodies in a van outside a hospital. Um, he walked. He worked quite closely with a local, uh, a local uh, guy from the area, and the last broadcast he did was him interviewing uh, uh, a local guy that had just lost his father. That was on the seventh of February, which was his last broadcast, and he's disappeared, and so has the the local uh, person that was helping him. So they've vanished. Uh, in Iran. A lot of the journalists are getting harassed, getting detained, and, and they're actually getting um, charged for spreading, uh, you know, rumours against the state. So, again, just be conscious, as with uh, a lot of the, the, the environments, we, you know, you find yourself as journalists, 
be conscious of the secondary um, threats that we may face. The other thing we've got to be conscious of is the PPE, personal protective equipment. Do we have the applicable uh, personal protective equipment? And if we don't, then really, you know, it's 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 a no go, because we can. We one thing that that can never happen with this uh, environment is complacency. You know, occasionally you might be lucky with complacency in in, in war zones. Uh, you might be lucky in the occasionally in protests, but it catches up with you. But with this. If you're complacent and it catches up with you, the repercussions could be devastating. And we're not just talking about to you. You may be killing people that you don't, you will never meet. You know, this ripple effect can be catastrophic. So, you know, this is something that we 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 cannot forget. And uh, you know, as Kane said, we're just this is just the start. So we don't want to, uh, you know, make mistakes from um, and then learn from hindsight because. You know, that's uh, that's not going to work here. It's going to be devastating. All right, we need to have a layered approach to, to safety. And that's the same, you know, with all everything we do. So the more layers we can put in between us and the threat, which is, you know, the coronavirus, the, the, the better we are. And, th and these, this needs to start with habitual um, layers. You know, like Kane said, not touching our faces. Uh, constant awareness to you know our hands and the fact that they can be contaminated and they could be an object to uh, you know disseminate this this infection further so we need to always be conscious about what we're touching another thing that we need to um, uh, be be conscious of is you know not not touching personal personal space uh, personal contact so we've really got to change the way we do things we've got to get we've got to change our, our muscle memory so because it's often when we we're, we're not thinking about it that we'll go back to these habits that potentially could um, could infect many people and then we need to establish a centered uh, understanding and a really you know an accurate perception of what this virus does and we need to base our practices and protocols on this and and you know as as a as a group as a network it's something that should be common and it needs to be established and and shared and we need to establish that culture of awareness to the threat and then the, the you know the protection methods we're going to have in place personal protection and, and that sort of thing another thing we've got to start thinking about is revised techniques in the way we do things so our interviewing techniques, again, personal space, uh, social distancing, the use of a microphone, you know, the days of interviewing with a shared mic, you know, we've got to think about that now. So we not, might have to think about different styles of microphone, uh, a centralized mic, uh, this sort of a, a mic shield. And then remembering once we've uh, finished the task, that piece of equipment has to be sterilized. And a microphone could be a very uh, contaminated piece of equipment. So we've got to be conscious of that. And the same with all our equipment. Sterilization before, sterilization uh, afterwards. And it has to become habitual. Okay, we've got to think about, and this is all in the planning stages, you know, how we're going to dispose of contaminated uh, items. So, you know, when we get home, what is our systematic approach to decontaminating ourselves, as Kane's already mentioned? It has to be done in a logical and systematic uh, a, a sequence. Otherwise, all we're going to do is a loop of, of recontamination. So, uh, you know, as Kane said, come in, conscious of what you touch, wash your hands. Once you've washed your hands, think about, you know, the clothing. Is it contaminated? Then it needs to come off. Before you do that, you do your equipment. So, you know, my system would be I'd decontaminate my hands. I would spray my equipment. You know, I would wipe that down because there's no point uh, doing my clothes first and then my equipment and then decontaminate then contaminating my body. So, again, think about the system. And it has to be logical. All right, think about the supplies that you may need. You know, if we go out on a task, what about post task? You know, if I come back and all of a sudden I hear that I've been with someone that's contaminated 
or I'm starting to get the signs and symptoms, have I prepared to go into lockdown? You know, or am I going to go, you know, go outside and then potentially contaminate a lot of other people because I didn't have any supplies in the house? I didn't think about what if, you know, what if I get back and I'm contaminated? How am I going to do this? Have you spoke to colleagues or, or other family members about getting supplies to you? Maybe you incorporate a dead letterbox type scenario where someone will come, they'll give you a call, they'll drop the groceries on the door, they will leave, and then you will go out and grab the groceries. You know, and these are all things you need to be thinking about well in advance so that we can reduce the impact when we have to go into these, um, these isolation uh, techniques. And, and you know, to be honest, it's quite likely that at some stage through this, we may all have to do this. So we, we you know, I'm prepared for it now. I'm, I'm, and, and I didn't go out and, and, and go into a mass panic buy. I just trickle fed uh, the stuff into my house. And what I do now is when I go out, I make sure I get as much as I can without being, without being selfless, but being realistic in what I need and what, what I can take back. Okay, we've also got to think about revised newsroom practices and Kane's touched on a lot of them already, but you know, like the, the common areas, uh, keyboards on laptops, I mean, how infect, think about how infected they can be. Maybe we can't share laptops anymore. Uh, and if someone comes onto a laptop, laptop, the first thing they do is decontaminate their hands. The last thing they do is sterilize the laptop and then decontaminate their hands again. So we need to enforce these sort of practices door handles, um, all of that type of thing. Make sure there's plenty of hand sanitizers and make sure we maintain the awareness. And, you know, if people become complacent, it's not just themselves they're harming. And that's what pe people have to be aware of. You know, I hear a lot of people saying it's, you, this thing will go away. It's not a cold. It's not a cold, this, and it's not just gonna go away. Right, so we'll think about operating in the field. So again, uh, we've got to be mindful of the risk to ourselves and the risk to others. So everything we do has to be calculated. We've got to have thought about it, broke down the steps and assessed each step. Same as we do with any other event, risks, mitigating measures. And at the end of the day, it's sanitization, sterilization, isn't it? Habits, habitual uh, practices. Thinking about the travel, spoke about that. Uh, know the high risk areas, make sure we're aware, the same as with any other task we do. You know, we've just got to think of this thing as an extremely hostile environment and treat it as such. Okay, be aware of the equipment we'll need to go out with us. So make sure we have a lot of hand sanitizer. You know, think of the, the duration of the task, uh, food that's sealed. You know, if you're going to take food with you, it needs to be come out of a sealed container. I wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't want to be reopening and reclosing food if you can avoid it. You know, once it's out, eat it. It's, we don't want to be storing stuff if we don't have to. Okay, make sure you've got uh, your emergency accountability plan in. So you know your emergency contact numbers. They know the person that's responsible, whether it's your editor, your manager, your colleague. They know who you're going to see, your timings, your expected, you know, what you expect to be doing, how often you're going to check in, all of these sort of things. And, and within that accountability plan, you need to keep an a, a account of who you talk to, who you're in close proximity with. And there needs to be an accountability plan both ways so that if someone discovers they're contaminated, they know they were in touch with you then they need to advise you that they have just been diagnosed or, or, or confirmed. And then you've got to start thinking about who you have been in touch with from that point on. So it needs to be, we've got to maintain awareness now of who we become in contact with. So the reality of it is, is we don't need to be in contact with anyone unless it's necessary. You know, otherwise it's, it, we can't control this. And by not controlling it, we're endangering ourselves and many other people. So the biggest key to this is control measures. All right, and uh, we, with that, we need to um, avoid groups, avoid physical contact, touching our face, hand washing, and that's it. Post tasks, self-monitor ourselves. 
if we feel like we've got the, uh, we're getting sick or the signs and symptoms, let somebody know, go into self-isolation and separate ourselves from the people that we live with. All right, we're gonna expect to be dealing with managing stress, anxiety, depression. These are real consequences of this. So take a break if you feel overwhelmed. Self-help, you need rest, you need sleep, you need to eat. You know, we've got to self-care, self-help, and try and have a, a balanced work-life environment because this, this could be lasting a long time. So we'll close it there and we'll, uh, we'll open sure. up the floor. I'll, well, I'll hand back to Andy and um, we'll see about some question and answers here. Yep, that's cool. Thanks, guys. That was, that was really, really excellent. Um, just for everybody who's still with us, we've got around about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, I noticed that there are already five or six logged in the system. Kane, can you see those on, on your side? Or Roger, have you got those? You can click that button and you should be able to. Uh, yes, there is a little Q&A box. But while we've got everybody still online with us, if you do want to ask an additional question, please put it into the Q&A box ASAP so we can get to those and uh, the guys will uh, will get to get to answering those um, in the order that they come up. Yeah, so we're just, uh, mm -hmm. we'll chip through them. Fantastic. So question number one, uh, should we be working in teams, journalists and camera people, etc.? cetera? Um, so look, <laughs> At the current time, I hope after all of the uh, all of the graphs that I put up about the importance of social distancing and, and social isolation, uh, you'd be trying to minimise that. I mean, you notice that we have sat next to each other, but only for the shortest possible time. For most of the presentation, we weren't doing that. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but when Roger was speaking, I actually leant back so that I wasn't in his um, in his breath. Uh, we've obviously all been washing our hands and stuff. So look. To an extent, life can require you still to be working around other people, but you just have to be very disciplined about what you're doing when you're doing that. So you've got to be aware of the risks. So you've got to be keeping your hands clean, not touching your face, trying not to be next to the person you know, in, in close proximity as much as possible. So the answer is yes, you can still be working in teams, um, but you know, as little as possible and as carefully as possible, I think is the answer to that. Uh, shared trans. The next question: What about shared transport to assignments? I would suggest uh, that you certainly avoid it. Um, if you're going to, uh, if you if you've got the ability, take you know both drive. If you've got your own vehicles, take your own vehicles. Meet at the location, wherever possible. We want to maintain this social distancing. So the answer to uh, these questions are is really based on the protocols that we've given and, and if you're breaching if you're going against the protocols that, that we've recommended then if there's any way of avoiding it you should do your utmost to avoid it so should you share transport the answer is not really not unless it is absolutely unavoidable and then you might look at other measures in place so if you're going to share transport think about where you're sitting in the vehicle think about limiting what you touch is having the vehicle well ventilated. So yeah. you've got to still maintain that layered approach, but wherever possible, you know, avoidance is the best solution. Uh, next question. If we have had the virus, is it safe to go out into the community as a reporter? So by this, I presume you mean the course of the illness has run its course. So you've had your 14 days isolation, you've felt sick to whatever, you felt sick and better. Um, the answer is probably yes. <laughs> and I say probably yes because there are at least two anecdotal reports of Japan people that infected a second time. Uh, I, I won't say that it's solid evidence that this can happen because it isn't. They're just case reports at the moment. Um, and the thinking about them at this very early stage is that whilst the virus generates an antibody response in everyone, for these particular people, for some reason, the antibodies didn't persist. Um, so there may be a small subset of the population that can get this more than once, uh, which also happens with things like chickenpox when most people absolutely can't get it more than once. Um, there is a small subset of people that can, but there's not great evidence of that. Uh, like there isn't really any hard evidence of that at the moment. There's a couple of anecdotal case reports 
So if you've had the virus and it's done, uh, is it safe to go out? Probably yes, um, as long as you're not falling afoul of any of those secondary risks. So if you go out and then you get charged by the police for not obeying a curfew or something like that, then no, it isn't. So there's still other considerations, but you are probably safe from the virus, yes. Uh, the span, okay, next question. What about the lifespan of the virus on clothes? It annoyed me that that particular sub, uh, surface wasn't mentioned in that research either. So you've got to assume that it's somewhere lesser than on a hard surface. So the harder the, the surface and less porous the surface is, the longer the virus can last. Um, so you would think less time than certainly plastic or steel probably less than copper if you look back at those uh, things. So possibly only an hour or a couple of hours. Um, but again, until the research is actually done to show that, it would be very difficult to give you a great answer. Um, you should just assume that the virus is on yeah. your clothes and treat, it, treat them as contaminated. Uh, and that way you won't have a bad outcome. Uh, will soap and hot water work as well for disinfecting? Look, it's not ideal. So we really want a disinfectant that's got both a detergent aspect and an antibacterial or a bactericidal um, or an antimicrobial uh, rather content as well. So the ideal is to have something that has both soap in it and something that kills microbes. Um, so I can't give you an obvious answer. The research that's been done into that has been done into things that have a, a proper disinfecting uh, component to them as well, not just soap. So I would say no as to whether just soap and hot water would work for disinfecting that. I wouldn't trust that by itself, no. Can I just add another point to that? Um, some other advice I've heard uh, quite recently is try to avoid washing your hands with really hot water. Because of the amount of times and, and, and the habit we've got to get in with hand washing, if you, if you wash them in water that's too hot, you're going to end up cracking the skin and you're going to end up actually having uh, open uh, you know cracks within in the skin which then uh, can can open that up for infection so the latest i heard uh, working with uh, with and, and i'm sure you may um, be able to answer this more but the advice i was 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 wash your hands in in, in warm but not too hot of water yeah, that's, that's sound. And it's also one of the reasons they try and suggest for people to use alcohol-based hand rub more often rather than soap and water more often because that soap and water dries your skin out and then causes breaches in the skin, which then, of course, allow um, bacteria and other microbes to get in. So it kind of creates a problem. That's why in healthcare, you actually end up putting on a barrier moisturiser type cream because of how often you have to wash your hands. So that's something perhaps to consider going forwards that you might also want a barrier cream um, so that your skin condition doesn't deteriorate and you start exposing yourself to more risks through trying to do the right thing, um, definitely. So next question, uh, we never know where the mask has come from, The mask, whether the mask manufacturer is clean or not. What's the solution if we don't use a mask? Um, look, if you're getting a, a fresh box out that has never been broken before, then I think you have to assume that the mask is okay. Uh, the solution when you don't use a mask is, is kind of the solution for any risk assessment. You therefore have to assess the risk without PPE. Um, so if you were just going out in the general public currently, then no, you don't need a mask. Uh, you know, you only really need a mask if you're sick. Certainly, if you're going somewhere like you know a hospital ward or, or a place where you expect people to have COVID, you'd be much smarter to have a mask on if you can. Uh, is is the answer? That's the safest way. And one, then really, you probably have to adjust what you're willing to do uh, accordingly. Okay, I think we've got a kind of almost a repeat question. Do you guys have evidence that after two weeks in isolation, someone without symptoms is safe to cover stories outside or is this person able to be a carrier? Look, unfortunately, it's still pretty early days in the research into this particular coronavirus to give you an exact answer to that. The research I've read so far says that after the person's symptomatic, it takes about three days normally for a proper antibody response to deactivate the virus. So people actually aren't sick for that long. 
Um, and then again, for most people, you would expect at that stage, they cannot be reinfected. And yes, it would be safe for you to be outside and no, you would not be a carrier. But we do have these couple of anecdotes that have come out of Japan um, that suggest that perhaps we might discover otherwise uh, in some subset of people who get infected of, of we don't know what size um, in the future. But at the moment, they're just two anecdotal case reports. So as, as far as we know, um, you can only get this thing once at the moment. And yes, you'd be safe after you've had it once. Um, what I just need to say, Andy, uh, we're coming close to the one, uh, 20, one minute, one hour 29, and we just don't want this to sort of close and get cut off. So do you want us to carry on or do you want to step in and um, close it up and then maybe we can carry on with questions until it does does drop out? Andy? Hi, Rog, can you hear me on my end? My, uh, yeah, my we got you now. Yeah, there was just a slight delay. Yeah, a slight delay on my end as well. I think that's my internet connection. Uh, look, mate, I think, we're, I think we're good. We've got through the list of questions unless there's one more. There's one more question one. that's come through. If you want to, if you want to address that one, I'm aware that we've kind of hit our time limit, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have to call it a day shortly. But if you can get to that last question, and then we'll just do a very quick wrap up at the end, uh, yeah. and then we'll continue. thanks. Yeah, sure. So wearing a mask can can we share transport wearing a mask? Wearing a mask is another layer of protection. Okay, so you try and get one and a half meters away from the other person in the car so you wouldn't be seated next to each other if you could avoid it. You have the windows down, you try and increase the ventilation in the car, you try and shorten the trip as much as possible. Um, obviously, if, the, if you're feeling sicker and you don't get in the car to start with. So yes, you try and take all of those steps to control the risk as much as you possibly can. And yes, it would be slightly safer wearing a mask if you were sharing transport. Absolutely, that's an additional safety precaution you could take, yes. Okay, Andy, we'll, uh, we'll hand back to you. All right, and well, listen guys, thank you very much indeed for, for that brilliant and invaluable presentation this morning. Um, really essential information that I hope everybody who's been tuned in has found useful. I'd like to thank everybody who's still with us um, for having uh, sat through